we believe that that God is we're not processed theologians. <laughs> yeah, God, God is God is God, and and in the end of the day, we that's why we put our head on the ground. There, mm -hmm. There's a kind of submission at a certain point of of, of the intellect just to. Say. I completely applaud you, Hamza Yusuf. I agree with that 100%. But the problem is, you are not submitting your intellect to the scripture. Your reasoning is actually completely opposed to the scripture. You're saying, oh, we throw it up to mystery, throw it up to God, God is God. We don't really have a good answer to them, but we just have to submit. In today's episode, guys, I will be reviewing a recent interview that Hamza Youssef had in which he spoke for, I believe, several hours about many different topics related to Islam. But one specific aspect that I want to highlight and that I'm going to play a couple clips from is when he was questioned about his position, and as we know that Hamza Youssef is an Ash'ari uh, Sufi, his position on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his relationship to time. Is he quote unquote in time or is he atemporal or completely timeless? And if he's completely timeless and, and atemporal, meaning to the point that he doesn't even perform or do one action after another in terms of creating or in this case, which was highlighted by the interviewer, responding to prayer. How can a God, which is completely, or who is, completely timeless or atemporal, respond to his uh, servant's prayers? How is that possible? So these are some of the questions that they got into, which I thought was extremely interesting. I thought that the interviewer asked some pretty decent questions and gave some good pushback on Hamza Yusuf's response to these questions, but I'd like to give a little bit more pushback from myself because I don't subscribe to Hamza Yusuf's Ash'ari view, and I think that he's wrong uh, for a number of reasons, mainly because he contradicts the clear text of the Qur'an and Sunnah, but not only that, because it really doesn't make any sense. The Ash'ari position, actually, as you'll see, has to appeal to mystery. Wow, the Ash'aris have to appeal to mystery when it seems, for the most part, many times they're all about rationality and seeming like they have everything figured out, but Hamza Yusuf has to appeal to mystery in this case, and not just that, it's not just appealing to mystery, it's that the position itself doesn't make any sense, and hence, that's why he has to appeal to mystery. But anyway, let's take a look at some of these clips. On the question of God and time, they were diametrically opposite. Mm. One believed that God was um, uh, not in time, was timeless, and so existed totally outside of time. And the other believed that that was impossible and that God was in time, but God was everlasting without beginning and without end, but God was in time. And on that point, they were intellectual enemies, mm. whereas everything else, they, they were agree. exactly the same. Amazing. And, and that struck me. So in the Islamic tradition, has that been a, a, a point of, of dispute of how God re relates to time? Not really. I think that the, the, the Muslim, obviously time is an extraordinary um, experience. We're all experiencing it. So in the first part of this clip, uh, the interviewer is asking Hamza Yusuf, um, or at first he's mentioning these two different Christian, I believe, theologians, one that believes that God is in time and the other uh, believes that God is completely timeless or atemporal. And he uses that to then ask Hamza Yusuf, what about in the Islamic tradition? Have there been debates about uh, God's relationship to time and temporality and, and, or atemporal uh, nature of God and things of that sort? And Hamza Yusuf says, no, there hasn't been. Now, I'm just going to assume that he doesn't know any better, but I mean, it's really hard to say that, especially when he's taught classes on Aqidah, he's authored books related to it. You would think that he's aware uh, of the fact that in the Islamic tradition, many people, especially the early Muslims, as well as those who followed them, did not actually hold to the Ash'ari doctrine of God being completely outside of time, whatever that is even supposed to mean. Now, we don't necessarily have to say that God is quote unquote 
in time, um, because then the common response is, well, wait, don't you guys believe that time is a creation of God? Don't you believe that time is a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Well, you have to understand that that's based on a conception of time where time is like this sort of substance or independent substance that exists out there in the world. We don't believe that. And even Ash'aris themselves don't actually believe that, that time is a substance unless you, you know, have this, well, I'm not even going to get into that, the view of Arazi or some of the Mutakalimin. But nevertheless, the common view of time is that time is a relation. Time is relational in that sense. And so time isn't a substance or something that exists outside there in the world in that way. Time is a relation between events. And for the ethity position, time is a, primarily a relation between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's actions. So time is based on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's actions. When he does one thing after another, and we say that we're measuring time, right? It's based on that, the, the um, measurement between, so to speak, his successive actions or activities. Alternatively, time is also used as a measurement of change or a, measure, um, a relation in that sense about the relation between the celestial bodies in the case of um, the sun and the moon, for example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that they, he's created them as, uh, for ways in which we can measure time. And we still do that up until today in the modern age, right? But what I want to point out here is that Hamza Yusuf says that there's no actual dispute or debate between the different positions on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's relationship to time being completely timeless and outside of time, where the Quran and Sunnah never mention this language whatsoever, and in fact present him as a God, and this is something that I want to stress on, as a God, as a Rabb, as our Lord, who does one thing after another. The Quran says that he created the jinn before he created mankind. The Quran then also says that he will judge us on judgment day. That's not something that has happened yet. He created many different things before he created other things. He acts in succession. So the only sense in which we would even say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in time is only in the sense that we believe that he is a being who acts successively. He can do one thing after another. He create, can create one thing at one time and then create something at a later time. He can judge one person at one time and then judge someone at another time. He can speak at one time to some, a particular individual and then he can stop speaking to that individual and speak to someone else, etc., etc. We believe that he acts in succession genuinely because the Quran and Sunnah and the apparent meaning as understood by the righteous early Muslims and those who followed them understood it exactly in that way. There was no need to make tatwil of, or uh, understand these verses in a metaphorical sense. And you, you guys have to understand there's so many verses in the Quran and also so many ahadith that talk about Allah acting in succession. So to make tatwil or to have a metaphorical interpretation of all these different verses is much more vast and more problematic from our perspective than any of the verses that are related to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's yad or his face, etc., etc. Not that those aren't important and that they, it's important to point out the, the incorrect uh, tatwil that uh, many Ashadis and Maturidis do regarding those verses. But the, from purely the amount of verses that mention Allah's successive action far outweigh those other texts related to those specific sifat, okay? So that's important to note from the outset is he's, Hamza Yusuf is saying that there is no real dispute and if people want more information on this, they can check out my article which is available and I'll put it in the description which goes into this in detail and talks about the position of Imam al-Bukhari and the early muhaddithun, uh, the scholars of hadith which clearly uh, state this and Ibn Taymiyyah who, much to uh, the Ash'aris, unfortunately, who want to attack him, he is simply following their position on this. He's not coming up with anything new. So I just wanted to point that out from the outset. Um, but anyway, let's listen to what Hamza Yusuf actually has to say here later on. It's not sufficient. Mm. So I can understand and I respect greatly 
those uh, people, those philosophers, scientists, who, who are believers who believe that God is in time. Mm. Uh, you know, pick, pick names. Uh, uh, John Polkinghorne was one of the physicists I was referring to, or Richard Swinburne. Um, and and part of the reason for that, I think, is to make is to maintain God as a personal God in a real sense, as opposed to a kind of a, 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 a tortuous philosophical sense. Um, so he's pointing out one of the reasons why, uh, and he's talking about Christians, but that's really irrelevant, why people have this concept um, of rejecting, oh, God is completely timeless and atemporal, and this kind of idea that, to the point that you cannot even affirm that he genuinely acts in succession, is because this is not how God is described in the Quran or even in the Bible. He's not described that way, right? He's described as a personal God that is really related to his creation, that creates different things at different times. He's a being, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is, uh, can respond to prayer. That when we have certain um, afflictions that fall upon us and we cry out to him uh, for help and to, for, to him alone, hopefully, inshallah, that we know and we trust that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is someone who can hear our prayer and actually respond to our prayer. Not this concept of a philosophical God that, you know, astaghfirullah, excuse me to say, is almost like a frozen portrait or frozen picture that is incapable of doing anything different other than what he's done from all eternity. And to even do something from all eternity is complexing even to understand from the beginning. So we don't have this conception, and neither do Christians who actually read their Bible because that's not even the way their scripture presents it. Not to say that I'm using that as a hujja in this case, don't get it confused, but I'm just showing that the common uh, fitra or intuition or rational uh, disposition of human beings is to understand God as a being who is capable of acting in succession and therefore hears our prayers in real time and is able to respond to them accordingly, okay? Now, let's go and listen to see what Hamza Yusuf's response to this is about how can he reconcile a completely atemporal conception of God, like the Ash'ari conception of God, and a being who is described in scripture in the way that I just mentioned and who can respond to our prayers. I think people tend to overthink things <laughs> um, and, and, I, and I, you know, like I, I just feel like I'll shut down at that point because our prophet <laughs> said, don't reflect on eternity yeah. uh, because the, the, the intellect can't take it. And, and the, there are mysteries in religion um, that are impenetrable. And, and that's where submission comes into it, this idea of just submission. Like I, I feel that my life has shown me enough evidence, especially providential evidence of, of, of a, a caring, loving God. That's, that's been my experience. And it's not that I haven't had really difficult times and I, and I haven't suffered and, and I haven't had childhood trauma and things that have happened to me uh, that, that are very disturbing and disrupting. But I, overall, I just, I feel there is a providence in the world working that's, that's very powerful. And, and, and I, I think also that time, one of the things that time expands and contracts for us. Like I, I know we have this concept of baraka, blessing in time, and so that lives can have much more time than other lives. So I wanna stop and comment on that. And first I want to congratulate and even encourage Hamza Yusuf for some of the things that he said there. Now, what am I referring to? The fact that he said that in his own life, and I don't dispute this at all, that he feels that he has had a relationship with God a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the sense that he feels that there really is a loving and merciful and caring God out there who exists, who's doing these things, who's providentially ordering his creation. I want to applaud that. And I agree completely, not only in my own personal life and experience, but in speaking to others. But more importantly than that, is the fact that it is clearly stated that this is the case in the Quran and Sunnah. This is how we know this without a shadow of a doubt. And I'm gonna show one clear example about this in just a second. So I wanna applaud uh, Hamza Yusuf for his comments in that regard. But nevertheless, I also wanted to invite him to the Ethari Creed, to the Creed of Imam al-Bukhari as is expressed in my paper, which is in the description of this video. And 
the early Salaf before him. And what the Qur'an clearly states on its apparent meaning of many ayat, right? I want to invite Hamza Yusuf to that. Why? Because the Ash'ari creed, Ash'ari aqidah, cannot account for a all, for a, excuse me to say, for a loving God, for a merciful God, for a providential God who is really has a relationship with his creation and is truly acting um, and relating to his creation. They cannot account for that. And that's why in the beginning, he started out by appealing to mystery. And not to say that there aren't certain mysteri uh, mysteries in religion or certain things that we don't fully understand. I don't have a problem with that whatsoever. But the problem is that you are appealing to mystery based on affirming a false position because it contradicts the Qur'an and Sunnah. That's the problem with appealing to mystery in this case, not necessarily appealing to mystery in and of itself, right? I don't know, for example, when Judgment Day is going to be. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasn't revealed to, that to us. That's a mystery, right, in that sense. But I am not appealing to mystery in that sense because I'm holding to a doctrine which contradicts scripture. I am leaving it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or appealing to mystery because he has informed us that he didn't reveal that. He hasn't revealed when judgment day exactly will be. He gave signs of it, but not the exact day or hour. And he explicitly told us that he didn't do that. Even to the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, he did not reveal exactly when a day or hour would be. So I hope you see the difference between those two types of appeals to mystery and when it's appropriate and when it's not. And why can't the Ash'ari position actually account for a loving, merciful God? This is because, according to the Ash'aris, they don't believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is really related to creation. What do I mean by that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love and mercy is eternal, according to the Ash'ari, in that sense, of um, if you even, even if you granted for the sake of argument that they believe love is really a eternal intrinsic sifa, which they don't even actually believe, right? But even if you granted that, they believe that whatever Allah's mercy and love actually is, it's the same whether creatures existed or not. Meaning to say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not express his love or mercy in real time directed at and connected to creation. Whatever his love or mercy is, if it's temporal, then it's not really an intrinsic attribute. It's not really internal to himself. If it's hadith or has a beginning in time, then it would have to be extrinsic and external to Allah. If, on the other hand, you want to understand love and his mercy as something which is intrinsic to Allah, then it's nothing that is successive in any way. There's no difference between Allah's mercy and love eternally for his creation, whether they existed or didn't. Imagine saying that, that Allah's love and mercy for the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam is the same as when the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam didn't exist, meaning prior to him being created, is this, Allah's love for him is the same prior to him being created as it is for when he existed, after he was created, after he was born, after he received prophethood. His love and mercy is the same. There is no difference. What does that tell you? He's not really related to his creation in a genuine way. This is why I invite Hamza Yusuf to drop this uh, notion of this Ash'ari con conception of God of completely being timeless, because it's not in accordance with scripture, and it results or the lawazim of the position, are these type of statements. Now, Ash'aris won't explicitly state this, maybe, but it is the lazim of their qawl, of their statement and their position. Now, let's take a listen further to uh, a couple more clips, inshallah. Modern believers say, if you say that God is not in time, there are other attributes of God that has to come along with that, and that God can't change, that God is impassable, that nothing can have an impact on God which seems to undermine intercessionary prayer. I mean, they get into a lot of complexities of God is out of time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we, yeah, we believe that, that God is, we're not processed theologians. <laughs> yeah, God is, 
God is God. And, and in the end of the day, we, that's why we put our head on the ground. There, there's a kind of submission at a certain point of, of, of the intellect just to say that this, this yeah. is beyond my, it's beyond my pay grade, but yeah. it's not beyond my prey grade. Oh, okay, that's a nice, nice phrase. Yeah. Uh, 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 but then the intercessionary prayer, uh, uh, can God listen in, in, in time? And Ibn Atayla, one of the great uh, Egyptians said that prayer was solely for a display okay. of utter submission before God. And, but the Quran and the Hadith indicate that God does answer prayers. So that's the normative position, that God will answer prayers. But obviously the knowledge of God is, is absolute. It's not that there's this idea of aforeknowledge of God is already presupposing time. Yeah. So, so if God is just eternal and, and God's knowledge is absolute, there's, there's no past or present. Mm -hmm. There's just pure knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so God can answer the prayers. <laughs> yeah, it's not a problem for me. <laughs> so he's asking a very good question. How can you say that God answers prayers in real time if you're saying that he's completely timeless and outside of time and atemporality and all this kind of stuff? It doesn't make any sense. And the interviewer, who happens to be an atheist, and I don't agree with him about many things, but nevertheless, he's asking good, pressing questions for Hamza Yusuf's view. How does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, according to him, answer people's prayers if he's completely timeless and outside of time? If he's this static being, that he's the same eternally in every respect, he didn't do anything differently than, he, than right now. It doesn't make any sense. Now, Hamza Yusuf says in Islam, which Islam is submission, we have to submit our intellect again. I completely applaud you, Hamza Yusuf. I agree with that 100%. But the problem is you are not submitting your intellect to the scripture. Your, your reasoning is actually completely opposed to the scripture. And then because of that, and because you can't answer these pressing questions and objections, you're saying, oh, we throw it up to mystery, throw it up to God. God is God. Yeah, it is what it is. We can't answer really these questions. We don't really have a good answer to them, but we just have to submit. Why not actually submit to the Quran and Sunnah on its apparent meaning based on what it actually says, rather than accepting these false philosophies which are alien to the text of Scripture, and then claiming that you must submit to them. No, submit to the apparent meaning of the Qur'an, and then if you run into a problem, then put your hands up and ask for Allah's mercy and ask for greater understanding in that. Why don't you do that? That's what I'm suggesting to Hamza Yusuf, and I mean that sincerely. I pray that he would accept that. I pray that he would submit his intellect to the scripture, and this doesn't mean, don't get it confused, people, that I'm saying, reason and revelation contradict. No, we don't believe that. We believe that the naql and the aql are impossible for them to contradict. Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah has an entire text in detail explaining that and refuting the Ashari confusion and position on the issue, okay? So this is extremely important. And that's why I'm inviting Hamza Yusuf to actually accept the Athari position and do away with this Ashari aqidah. Now, there's another point that I want to actually play again because it was so important to listen to what he said. Remember, he's asking about intercessory prayer. How does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hear and respond to our prayer? Great question. And one point to note is, and this deserves an entirely separate video, is the Ash'aris and Maturidis who believe in what Hamza Yusuf is saying are very famous for doing istighatha or actually calling out to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to calling out to uh, the prophets, for example, to calling out to uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which we believe is completely goes against the text, and this is a whole nother topic. But notice why this might be, and this is a hypothesis. When you have the position of somebody like Hamza Yusuf, that God is completely distant, he's completely atemporal, astaghfirullah, like a frozen picture, he cannot actually hear and respond to your du'as, your prayers in real time. Well, if that's your conception of God, then you have to create these intermediaries, these saints, these prophet-like, or these prophets, 
that they are prophets, truly, but you give them abilities that normally we would ascribe to God that can hear and answer your prayers in real time, but because they don't actually believe that about Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, they actually remove that from Him and give it to the prophets and give it to these saints and give it to the awliya of Allah. Because they don't actually properly attribute it to Allah, they attribute it to them and therefore they call out to them. This is truly what the problem is. This is how they result or wind up in this position of istighatha. So I want people to also consider that. But let's take a listen again to what he said about prayer here. Can God listen in, in, in time? And Ibn Atayla, one of the great uh, Egyptians said that prayer was solely for a display okay. of utter submission before God. In trying to respond to the objection, well, this one scholar said, that really what prayer is about is just to show your utter submission and reverence for God. So he's basically making that wheel of prayer. Prayer is not really about connecting with your Lord, about your Lord hearing your prayers and responding to them when you actually call out to him. Prayer is merely, because we can't say that, prayer is merely about showing your submission to Allah. Now not to say that it, there is no aspect of dua of submis submitting to Allah and um, not to deny that, but that's not the only element or even necessarily the primary element, right? He's completely negating this other aspect. And then he goes on to rightly say, but you know, because the Quran and Sunnah say that Allah answers prayer, that's actually the normal or the normative position. Now, why would he say that? Let me just show, uh, share my screen here and show you guys a verse of the Quran, which is very clear and concise, but right on this point. In the Qur'an, right, Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 186, it says what? And when my servants ask you, O Muhammad, concerning me, so when my servants ask about uh, me, about Allah, what is the Prophet supposed to say? Or what is he supposed to uh, relate to them? Indeed, I am near, meaning, indeed, Allah is near. He is Qareeb, right? I respond to the invocation, I respond to the dua of the supplicant, of the person who's making dua when he calls upon me. So let them respond to me by obedience and believe in me that they may be rightly guided. So important this verse, and it completely negates the Ash'ari notion of prayer and who we are to call out to and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds and all of these things. When my servants ask you concerning me, Indeed, I am near. I respond to the invocation of the supplicant when he calls upon me. So he says, when my servants ask you, he says, he res that's when he responds. So when the servant calls upon Allah, that's when he responds. Not eternally and then trying to explain about these relations and all this other stuff. No, when my servants ask you, indeed, I am near. So he is qareeb, he is near when his servants call upon him. And he responds to the dua when his servants call upon him. Not eternally before they even exist or are created. He responds when his servants call upon him. This cannot be affirmed, unfortunately, with the Ash'ari position. And because of that, they go against and negate the clear and apparent meaning of the Qur'an, which I showed in my previous video on Sa'id Foda and his good buddy that, as you saw on the screen uh, there before, Al-Amadi says explicitly that the zahir of the Qur'an is not a hujja. The zahir of the sunnah is not a hujja. The zahir of even the statements of the imams are not a hujja. Why? Because he knows it contradicts their position and therefore they cannot consider it a genuine evidence when it comes to matters related to aqidah. With that being said, guys, I hope that you enjoyed this video. I hope that you found it educational. If you did and would like to see more videos like it, please consider subscribing to the channel and hitting the notification bell to get notified of future videos. Like this video and comment on it. Let me know your thoughts. I don't mind people disagreeing me, with me, but if you come with just um, obscenities and you come with just attacking people without any substance whatsoever, I just delete those comments and block people. I don't have time for foolishness. Also, if you want to, please consider sharing these videos, on, including this one, on your social media platforms with your friends and family, no matter how big or how small your reach is. 
it really does help with the algorithm. And unfortunately, guys, we have to play that game in terms of dealing with these algorithm bullies like YouTube. <laughs> Hope they don't censor this video now. Um, and if you want to go above and beyond and support my channel and would like to see me uh, publish more videos like this, then the best way to do so is at the GoFundMe link, which is pinned at the top of the description of this video, as well as my other videos. It really does help, and I appreciate your guys' support. May Allah bless and reward you all. With that being said, guys, until next time, insha'Allah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.